My name is Jen Householder. I am a uh, UH-60 pilot for the U.S. Army Reserves. After college, I went straight into the Air Force as a lieutenant, and um, the majority of that time I got to be a flight test engineer at Edwards Air Force Base, working on the F-22. I flew the little uh, TH-67s, the Bell 206, that was what I learned to fly on, but transitioned to the, the Black Hawk. So. That's, so flight school was an amazing experience because for the first time in my life, I felt like you know, I stepped into what I was created to do. Um, I, I hope that more people get that opportunity to step into whatever it is their dream and their desire and passion, but I got that opportunity. It was just this amazing gift. That was my dream to be a pilot. I had you know, originally a fighter pilot, but I'll tell you what, flying helicopters is it's just a lot of fun. Halfway through my flight school, my commander calls up and says, hey, we're going to Iraq when you get back. So, so I went straight from, I finished flight school, got my wings, and now I'm getting ready to, to prep and go to combat. This unit that I was in, uh, in the Army National Guard, they hadn't deployed since Korea, the unit itself. And so it was, it was definitely a challenging experience just from you know, people that never thought that would actually find themselves in that situation. And what I learned is that if, you, if you're not solid in your core values and who you are, and you're not strengthening the, those things, then you're, you're, more, you're, going to, you're going to buckle when the pressure um, turns up. And so that's, that created a very hostile environment. Sure, we were there to fight the enemy. Any place you go, you're always going to have a few bad apples um, with personal agendas or character flaws that, that uh, they're unwilling to adjust. One of the things that, that uh, they resented was women in leadership positions, both as officers and NCOs. There was definitely um, some inappropriate generalizations and uh, stigma to, to that. You know, you're in a foreign land, you're in combat, you're away from your family. Um, you don't get to dictate your schedule. So all of, all of that happening, so that's stressful enough. That, cause, that makes it difficult to do your job knowing that there's so much dissension within the ranks and people are forming alliances. And out of that, what happened to me personally was um, there were rumors, you know, there were rumors that, about me. And I'm thinking, are, are we here to, to fight and to, to do a mission? So, I mean, of course they weren't true, but it was absolutely devastating to me who, uh, you know, one of my core values is in integrity. And um, so to have, to have my character be called into question like that was very, um, very devastating to me. I brought it to my commander. Uh, I said, hey, sir, I, I'd like you to do a commander's inquiry because I, I don't understand where these rumors are coming from, why they're happening, but it's, it's very upsetting. And of course, you know, he, he said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sign somebody to, to research that and figure out what's going on there. But he had trouble understanding why I was so upset about it. He's like, Jen, you know, you're, you're so intelligent, you're so successful, why do you care what these idiots are saying about you? And, you know, I, I couldn't articulate it to him why it was very upsetting. Um, and so it, it ended up, uh, I ended up saying, just forget about it, just drop it, we'll, you know, we'll forget about it because it was causing so much distress because I didn't trust anybody. That's the other thing. In this hostile, hostile work environment, there was so much distrust and betrayal and, and backstabbing happening that um, I didn't know who I could trust to, to carry out that commander's inquiry in a way that, that would be honorable. What happened during that 2005 deployment resonated with some things that happened to me as a kid, those feelings of betrayal, um, distrust, abandonment by the people that were supposed to be on my side, you know, these are the people that are supposed to have my back. I went to see a counselor doing the talk therapy, um, you know, engaging uh, friendships, family, you know, continuing to uh, you know, stay healthy every way, every way I knew to just stay engaged in life, which I see the value now of the, the when you're really building that resilience and your spiritual, your mental, your physical, and your social social aspects of your life, that that's what gave me what I needed to weather the storm, because I didn't have the answer yet. I had, I had many more uh, good experiences in the military than I ever had of the bad experiences. 
So it wasn't so much that, but it was all of that turmoil from the childhood that got triggered. And so in a sense, going and deploying and knowing that I'm doing a mission, I'm doing the thing I feel like I was called to do in life, that, uh, that was um, a huge resource for me. That gave me a reason to live. So in a sense, that was, that was good for me. I needed a reason to live because I didn't have the answers yet on how to, to heal. I hadn't stumbled on that stuff yet. I had a suicide note. I had a plan what I was going to do because I was, I was at this place where I, you know, I had tried so long to try to work through, um, to, to, to separate myself from what happened to me as a kid. And it was like the past would not let me go. I, I came to a, a point of crisis. And all I can say is I, it's a miracle that I made it through that deployment, through that experience. And I have to say it, it was because of those resources in my life. And, and that's the value of, of engaging and investing in resilience in those areas, because that's what enabled me to weather the storm long enough. So when I got home and I met Jan Click, who is my counselor, when I met her and she told me about you know, the community resilience model, the trauma resiliency model, talk, talk, showed me uh, various types of therapies and techniques to help me work through that trauma, explained the science behind what was happening to me. And that's what began to ch shift everything in my life. So when I was stuck in that high zone, anxiety, there would be, uh, I'd have feelings of panic, there was a lot of irrational thoughts, like, like the world's gonna fall apart on me, something's chasing me, you know, just this, this panicky survival kind of uh, reaction. And that's kind of where I lived. I didn't, and I didn't know, I had tried the whole mind over matter and pushed through the pain. Um, but what I realized about, and this is what I learned um, about, with the community resiliency model, is that you're, when you're keyed up like that or you're down in that low zone, you don't respond to words, to the verbal, you respond to sensation. And so when I learned to begin to track my body and learn what, what it, when I'm keyed up, what does that feel like? And then when I'm in that resilient zone in that even keel, what does that feel like? And then learning certain skills to be able to, to move me back into that resilient zone and, and I'm affecting the nervous system. And that's what I'm, and I didn't know that that's why I had all that, um, why I pendulated between uh, those two places. I had no idea that that's, that was because my nervous system had been dysregulated. I don't think I ever had a regulated nervous system until you know, five years ago when I, or four years ago when I started learning these skills. It affected my work. Um, I, I performed better, had better social connections. You don't make good decisions and perform well when you're in one of those two places. You just don't. You, because um, you, 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 you're missing all of this other important information. You're kind of acting in that survival mode. It takes work and it takes commitment and every day using these skills, the community resiliency model takes that commitment because it's not it's this isn't an overnight quick fix and it's a lifestyle to so, so it, it takes that but it is absolutely possible we don't have to stay in that place of, of of pain we don't have to stay in that place of of hopelessness 